immediately following services tonight, I would like to have a very brief meeting with for the uh, Vacation Bible School. It will be very brief, I promise you. But we do need to get some things started and uh, I try to get some plans made, but uh, uh, we need to get that kind of kicked off. And so if you can, if you have a little bit of time, please do that. We need all the help out we can get, so keep that in mind. Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. The word meditate means to ponder. It means to roll over in your mind, to think about it over and over and over. There are three sources. Uh, let's see here. Where am I at? Oh. There are three sources of knowledge. The instinct, that's what just comes natural. It's like taking a breath. There's the rote from repetition. Then, of course, deliberately attained through the effort of reading or studying from ourselves. This is how we gain our knowledge. And we meditate, of course, in the latter. We want to understand what God has written to us, what God has told us. We need to meditate on that word. Now, the word meditate is used quite a few times, especially in the book of Psalms. And David talks a lot about meditating on the word of God. Our, you know, I, I really like the, the definition of the term of rolling it over, rolling things over in your mind, thinking about it. You know, a lot of times when I'm preaching or getting ready to preach or teach a class, I'll study something and it'll get in my mind and it just rolls over and over. I keep thinking about it, meditating on it. That's what the psalmist is saying in Psalm 1 verse 1 that we meditate on his law night and day. Keep rolling over our mind. There are certain questions that's asked in the Bible that deserves our meditation. One of those takes place in the book of Psalms, chapter 8. If you would, turn to Psalms, chapter 8. Verses 3 and 4. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? The question that David asked, what is man? How does man fit the plan of God? Where does man come in the picture at? You know, when the question is asked, what is man? It brings up a lot of different thoughts and ideas. But in this context, there's two that I want to discuss. First of all, what is man relative to the universe? What's his relationship with the universe? Secondly, what's man's relationship with God? Well, what does the universe have to do with anything? Well, that's what I want, we want to talk about. You see, man is a part of the universe. Now, when you think about the universe, I love Psalm 148, verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. So, so that looks like a song we sing, doesn't it? <laughs> Praise Him, all your angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. 
Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you stars of light. Praise you, you heavens of heavens. I almost want to say hallelujah, but anyway. Praise Him, you heavens of heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded and they were created. Where did the, these items of nature, these segments of the universe, where did they come from? From a commandment of God. God spoke, and they came. They were created. Now, talking about the vastness, this is something I have a trouble understanding. According to some smart guys I was reading this week, if that first dot on your screen, on this fake blackboard we've got, from the first dot, which represents the sun, to the second dot, which is the earth, represents 93, almost 93 million miles. 93 million miles to the sun. If that's not mind-boggling enough, if you take these chalkboards and run them for four miles in one direction, and then put another dot, that's how far it is with each inch representing 93 million miles to the first star we can see. Uh, folks, I can't figure that one out. God created such a vast universe, and we're only one of several. No wonder when David would think about nature and the universe, the stars. He would say, A fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. These things could not have just happened. But God is so great and powerful, He could create this vast universe by speaking it into existence. Now, that's God's work. That's what God did. And I can't begin to, to understand not only the vast nature of our, our, our wonderful universe, but I can't wrap my head around a creator that majestic, that powerful, that strong. But that's our God. Now here I am, all one foot, not one foot, five foot eleven, 185, just this little freckle in this vast universe. Now how do I relate to that? Kansas had the song, and I've used this before, all we, all we are is dust in the wind. You know, to the humanist and to, to a lot of people today, the way they think, we are just that particle of dust that's been blowing in the wind. That really, there, there's no substance to man. That man is just simply what man wants to be. That there is really no direction. You've met people like that. I've met people like that. But when we think of this universe, we think of God's power. And God's power as not only it relates to the universe, but to us. But look at this, Romans 1 verse 20. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even, watch this, his eternal power and Godhead. Talking about the, the, the uh, Gentiles so that they are without excuse. 
the things, his attributes that are, notice, clearly seen. When you look up in the heavens and you look at that vast universe and, and think about that star that's so many millions of miles away, and we see the divine power of the Godhead, we recognize it. We're without excuse to say there's no God. God commanded, when you look in the Genesis account of the creation, in every day of creation, and God said, God said, let there be light. In fact, the way it's worded in the Hebrew is, light be light was immediately there wasn't a day went by before there was light we're talking about in, in just the snap of a finger God commanded it and it happened there is no way number one that evolution can be correct and no way no way that theistic evolution can be correct. Besides the fact that the word yom means day, 24-hour day. Well, I'm not on that, but anyway, just a little side note. God said, and it was so. The earth didn't come about by accident. Didn't happen accidentally. Not by evolution, definitely. Not by the Big Bang. Not by spontaneous generation. Uh, yeah, generation. I, this one tickles me. I, I read an article about spontaneous generation. And it said that there was a time when man believed that if you took and bound up a little bit of grain and left it in your grain bin, that it would turn into a mouse. <laughs> That's a true story. I'm not making that up. You know why? Because this makes sense, okay, if you're just looking at this thing. You know, they have this grain, and then also the, here comes these mice out of the grain bin. Where'd they come from? Well, I guess they were made out of the, they just spontaneously generated out of that. That was the thinking of men. Well, that was pretty easily reduced down to a false thought, but uh, at any rate, it does not have a look how the uh, world came. You know, here's something interesting. The evolutionists trap themselves by saying that the earth is so many billion years old. I just threw that number up there. I don't know what they say. I don't, I don't care. They trap themselves. They said that because you know what? If you put a time, an age of the earth, what you're doing is you're saying that it had a beginning. It had a beginning. So, by the very fact that it had a beginning, it will have an end. So the beginning then has to be explained. And then the end of course, that's just the second law of thermodynamics. We're, the world is burning up. It's being used up as we speak. It's in the process of decay, just like you and I are. But it shows that it had a beginning in time. Now, as we already looked at, we had several things, items up here about what started the beginning, and we realize God said it, and it was so. 
Why is God mindful of man, our relationship with God, all of this vast universe? Number one, why did God make the universe? What's up with that? What's the universe for? What's the earth for? Why did God create that? Why did God create man? These are things, now, I don't know about you, but these are things that makes me meditate a little bit and think about it. Well, first of all, we do know that God created man. Genesis 1.26. Let us make man in our image. Well, God is a spirit. I'm flesh. So right there, I find out I'm not like God in the flesh. This muddy outside that I have is not what's in the image of God. For God is a spirit. Man is flesh. But within man, there is the spirit. In fact, turn with me, if you would, to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Now, to me, this is one of the most powerful passages of what is man. Or who is man? Look at starting at verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart. This is where we find our encouragement. We do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Now, I want, I want to put a little parenthetical uh, condition on the new man is being renewed day by day. The new man is being renewed if that man is renewing his thinking. In Romans 12 and verse 2, it says that we are renewed through our thinking by our minds. We're renewed in the mind. As long as we are meditating and studying in the Word of God and we are renewing our thinking constantly, that inner man is going to be renewed. If not, that inner man is just going to be decaying. In its spiritual life becomes weakened. That inward man is being renewed day by day. It doesn't get, if we are renewing our, our minds, we're not getting weaker every day, we're getting stronger. Now, aren't you glad of that? Anybody over 60, when the bones start creaking and aching, you start moving around a little bit slower. You know, when our cologne starts smelling like Ben Gay, you know what I'm talking about? Okay? That's where we are. But that new man within us it's been renewed. You gotta, that's gotta make you feel a lot better. Now, let's go on. A lot of affliction, boy, Paul calls why he went through a lot of affliction. Compared with what we have waiting for us, it is. So, by a lot of affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, 
but the things which are not seen. Let me tell you something. If all we had to look at today was what we are seeing in our world, it would be in a, a state of constant depression. But you move the veil of this world and look, you, look beyond into eternity, there's our hope. That's where we find our solace. That's where we find our comfort and our joy. For the things which are seen are only temporary. I'm so happy. They're only temporary. But the things which are not seen are eternal. I lost a real good friend this past December. I'd known her for 40 years. Her husband and I were best friends. He and I have been texting back and forth. And he's struggling, losing his wife. One day we were, think, we were talking, texting. And I said, Rocky, she, this, this lady was a, was a doll. She was a Christian from uh, day one. I said, Rocky, imagine this. What did she see or what is she seeing right now? What is she looking at right now? You won't get tied down in this world. We're not. I know what I want to be looking at. Don't you? All right. For we know that if our earthly house, that's this, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Not this body. This body, you know, I think Ecclesiastes, uh, I can't remember exactly where, maybe 12, talks about this body goes back to the earth, where it came from. It's mud. I'm a mud cake. Well, it goes back to mud, or, or goes back to the, the dust of the ground. But the Spirit returns to God. The Spirit goes to God. Now, I don't, I don't really particularly like the fact that a lot of people compare me to a monkey. You know, when a monkey dies, he's dead. He's mud ball. That's it. When I die, I'm going to where God wants me with Him. Don't call me a monkey. Well, you can, but I'm not going to answer. Man is flesh, but man also has within him a spirit that is the image of God. And I will tell you something. That means we have to live differently. We have to read differently, meditate on things differently. To maintain that kind of, of uh, relationship. God created man, we talked about this a little bit this morning, God created man knowing he would sin. God created man knowing he would have to sacrifice Jesus. Yet he did it. Why? Oh, there's a lot of answers I've heard in my life. Why did he go ahead and make man? Well, uh, by the way, you know, if I ask the same question about the universe, you know why God made the universe? Well, I'll tell you in just a minute. Well, God was lonely, somebody said. He needed his companions. He had the Godhead. And by the way, okay, think about this for a moment. Where was God born? You say, what? When was God born? Well, he's eternal. We don't have any way of knowing any kind of time for God because God is timeless. 
therefore, he spent eternity alone with the Godhead. So do you really think he needed us as a companion? Isaiah 55, verse 8. The problem is sometimes we tend to think God thinks like we do. God does not think like we do. And Isaiah 55 Isaiah wrote, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. My thoughts than your thoughts. We can't even begin to know how God thinks, so quit trying. You're not God. Just understand that He created us. And there's a reason. Oh, I heard one preacher say, because God needed us. Why did he need us? Little old puny man, the most magnificent, outstanding, amazing, majestic being ever will be. My God, how does he need men? You know, you look at Acts 17, 24. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Do you know why those temples were built? They weren't built for God, they were built for man to worship God. Just like this building. That wasn't his home. He didn't dwell in those temples. His home's in heaven. God built us because he loved us. Just that simple. Even though he knew, he knew we would betray him, we would sin, and because of that sin, he was going to have to offer up his son as a sacrifice, he still built us. As that song says, if that's not love, what is? And this universe he built, that's not his playground, that's our playground. He built it for us. For us to enjoy. As long as it lasts. But I've already said, it's only temporary. The only thing, the only thing in our life that is eternal is God. In our spirit. We're getting older. We, most of us here today, or a lot of us anyway, are at the end of our lives. Whenever I was in high school, and it was time for finals, I had a tendency to put things off, procrastinate somewhat. A lot of time my papers were just barely on time, and I would study for my major tests on the night before, and then pray for a miracle. But you know something? Can't do that with my my eternal spirit. I can't I can't just cram for the final years of my life that I might go to God. Young people remember the Creator in the days of your youth. Because one of these days you're going to look in the mirror just like I did and say, hey, when did I get old? It's been a great ride, but I know my ride is about over. 
Somebody said, well, your dad lived to be 100. Yeah, he did, but that's just 30 years away. And I'm pretty positive I'm not going to make the, th the 100. But it don't matter. It does not matter. When I look at how much God loved me, and we talked about that this morning, about sending His Son to this earth, not only am I humbled, I'm challenged. When I go out of this world, I want to go out for Jesus. I want to spend my last years glorifying Him. Even as this body grows old, I want to renew that man inside me, that eternal spirit. I want to prepare it. I want to get it ready. Because it's got a new home prepared for it. You know, we live sometimes like we're going to live forever. But folks, let's, let's face the reality. It's not happening. There's not a one of us sitting here that has any guarantees except for the very minute we're living. None of us. Things can happen quickly. So it behooves us to prepare. God loved us so much that even in our sins, Christ died for us that we might have eternal life. Why did He do that? It wasn't because we loved Him. It was because He loves us. How do we reciprocate that love? We love Him back. We can't outgive God's love. There's no way. But we can give Him all that we have and make our commitments to Him. Tonight, if you're a Christian, just think about going home. What that's going to be like. If you're a Christian, then thank God in for the gift that He has prepared through His Son. If you're not a Christian, let us help you become a Christian. There's no sense in anyone losing his soul after what God has done for us. No sense. But you know, one of the things that we have to realize that we are now no longer ourselves. Galatians 2 verse 20, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, but not I, but Christ lived in me the life I never now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, it's not about living for me any longer. Are you living for God? Are you living for Christ? Is he number one in your life? If he is, then you have been baptized. If you haven't been baptized and he's number one in your life, then you're going to be baptized. Because he is number one. And he's prepared the path of eternity. If you have a need, I encourage you to come while well, we stand and sing.